Our lesson today is on Karl Marx, conflict theory, and the Communist Manifesto. And this is a big lesson because it's not just about how history happened the way it did and why we should care. It's also about a way of looking at the world and how it works, maybe even today. And if you pay attention to this lesson with an open mind, it contains ideas that may change the way you see the world around you and may allow you to see it a little bit more clearly. Um, Karl Marx and communism are also very controversial topics, so this should be fun. A word on vocabulary first. There's some vocabulary that just comes with Marxism and communism um, that I'll go over now. So he refers to the common worker, a working class person as the proletariat, it's the underclass. It comes from the ancient Roman word for the underclass. Um, communism is an economic system, an economic ideology really, where workers control the means of production and everything is owned in common. The bourgeoisie or the bourgeois is a capitalist. It's a member of the middle or upper class that owns capital, it comes from French. And the means of production refers to factories, resources, machines, anything really that you need to produce finished products, to produce what society needs. Now you have already evaluated the Industrial Revolution in previous classes, and Marx was a thinker who spent a lot of his time doing just that. He looked not just at the great advances of industrialization, but also this big, increasingly moral problem of having an impoverished working class that worked 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 hour days to enrich an increasingly idle upper class of capitalists who only were upper class because they owned machines that others worked on. This is a problem that persists to the day. Um, escaping poverty, as has been mentioned in previous classes, requires almost 20 years with nearly nothing going wrong in the United States. Inequality is so great that you have a handful of people that own most of the resources of the world. And we can ask rightly, um, at what point does this become unsustainably immoral? When Marx evaluated the Industrial Revolution, he said, the Industrial Revolution, the part that involves using machines to make work easier, was great. The problem was capitalism. And in this analysis, he wasn't alone. Throughout the 19th century, as we've seen in previous lessons, social reformers tried to address the problems of industrial life, like unsafe working conditions, long hours, child labor, and low pay, that stemmed from this capitalist drive to increase products for the business owner. Through collective bargaining and strikes and democratic reform, workers slowly be began to create some change. As we've seen, um, by the 1800s, factory workers fed up with the harsh working conditions they had to deal with, fought for reform by forming labor unions. Socialists, meanwhile, viewed the capitalist system itself as being inherently wrong and argued that it was designed to create poverty and poor working conditions precisely because of its end goal of earning maximum profits for investors. If the, the government representing the people as a whole owned the means of production instead, these factories and industries would function in the public good as opposed to private interests, or so they argued. However, a group of more radical workers remained unsatisfied with the reforms being made by labor unions and moderate socialists. They argued that as long as capitalists controlled the means of production, the stuff that you need to create finished products and produce wealth in industrial societies, there would never be true equality. These radical socialists became known as communists. Communism is our third modern economic ideology that we're covering in this class. And it relates to an economic system in which the state has full control of the economy to produce what is needed with the end goal of ensuring equality in mind. So in this way, it's a radical or extreme form of socialism. Communists believe that the only way to create an equal society is by overthrowing the capitalist class through an actual armed violent revolution 
and giving the workers equal control over the means of production. Under a communist ideal society, private property would no longer exist. If you've missed our previous lessons on economic ideologies, please pause the slide here and capture capitalism, socialism, and communism in your notes before proceeding. Because as always, when talking about ideologies, it's really important to define your terms before you move forward. Because often you'll find people don't all use these words with the same definitions in mind. Karl Marx was one of the most influential modern philosophers, full stop. Um, he was a German philosopher and historian who got kicked out of Prussia for being too radical, moved to France, and then eventually settled in London during the height of the Industrial Revolution in England. So he saw firsthand the impact that industrial life had on the working class, and he worked to develop a new economic theory that would address the inequalities of industrial society. And he was a really keen observer of the environment around him. He was a journalist, an economist, a sociologist, so someone who studies society, how people work, a philosopher, and a radical socialist. Marx developed an economic explanation of history that we're going to look at in a sec. He wrote the Communist Manifesto, most famously probably with Friedrich Engels, who if you're in my class, you've already read parts of um, Engels' great work, The Conditions of the Working Class in England. And then he wrote Das Kapital um, following that, an analysis, a critical analysis of capitalism. So he's famous for two things that tend to get conflated. First, he's the intellectual father of communism. But second, he also developed a view of how history works and moves forward that you can accept and entertain without actually necessarily adopting his conclusion that communism was the right solution to what he saw as being the continuing problem of history. In Marx's economic explanation of history, he argued that history is the story of class conflict. Basically, whoever owns the means of production, which at the time of the Industrial Revolution would be the capitalists, develop laws and government systems to help them keep control. Because of this, the workers, the proletariat, are in conflict with the capitalists. Their interests don't merge. And the workers begin to see themselves in opposition to the capitalists. One of the reasons for this conflict, according to Marx, comes from a disagreement over why things have meaning and value. And here's where you can really see his philosophical side coming into play. According to Marx, the value of something comes from the work that goes into making it. As such, a communist would argue that an iPhone, for example, has value because of the hundreds of hours of labor that went into producing it. Similarly, all workers should be valued equally as long as they contribute equal labor. This is very different from the capitalist view of things. According to capitalism, value is based on how desirable an item is, supply and demand, right? In this case, demand. As more people want it, as demand goes up, they become more willing to pay for it. So a capitalist would argue that an iPhone has value because people are willing to pay a great deal of money for it. And the more you can decrease the cost of making that item, the more profit you'll be able to make from the sale of it. And that's the whole point of economic activity for capitalists. In other words, the class struggle here is between the bourgeois, the capitalists, the owners of the means of production who want labor at the lowest possible price, and the proletariat, the working class, who want to be paid as much as possible for their work, which, according to communists, is what gives things value. In the end, Marx argued that capitalists were stealing from the workers by paying them less for their labor than they deserved. And since these capitalists would never voluntarily give up their power, because people tend not to do that, Marx argued that the workers needed to unite and violently overthrow the capitalist class. So that, in a nutshell, is both Marx's theory of history and his proposed remedy to it, communism. And like I said, you can take one without necessarily accepting or entertaining the other. I found over the years that students tend to come into the lesson on communism with something of a closed mind because we've had pretty prominent examples of countries that 
say that they're communist, like North Korea, that kind of cloud their vision of this ideology and theory. So what I would ask is that you come into this lesson with an open mind. Consider Marx's theory of history first, and then separately try to understand how his view of history might lead him to push for an ideal world, a better world according to Marx, a communist society. So first, we're gonna look at his theory of history. This is sometimes referred to as conflict theory, and this is like big ideas, um, college level ideas. So really, I just want my students in 10th grade to listen and think about how well this matches your view of history, which you after all have been learning for quite some time now. So here's how Marx thinks that history works. Following our enlightenment pattern of starting with human nature as our source of reasoning for everything about society, Marx thought that human nature depended on the environment. So he didn't agree with Hobbes, Locke, or Rousseau necessarily. He didn't think that human nature was fixed. He thought that it changed depending on our circumstances. He thought people were compassionate as hunter-gatherers, for example, and became greedy under capitalism. This means that he thought that human nature could change with circumstances too, and that's gonna become important towards the end. Before the Neolithic Revolution, before people developed agriculture, way back around 10,000 BCE, humans depended on each other to survive, and they had a classless society, an egalitarian society, that shared the benefit of everyone's work. Marx called this primitive communism. Quickly, though, humans run into trouble. First, in terms of how our freedom is limited. Our freedom is limited first by nature itself, says Marx. If you look at a person, like take a look at yourself. We don't have a lot that we need to survive. We don't have pointy claws. We don't have sharp teeth. In the wild, we're kind of helpless. So we need to work together pretty hard just to stay alive. And working together just to stay alive limits our freedom to some extent. Once we overcome that, we form society to protect ourselves, to develop, to advance. Civilization, if you want. Our freedom then becomes limited by society itself. When humans settle into civilization, they create social hierarchies. If you'll remember from our lessons on the Neolithic Revolution and even on Enlightenment philosophy like Rousseau, this should resonate with both of those lessons. As soon as humans settle into society, we create inequalities and social hierarchy. Now, in society, we have a situation where some people work harder than they need to. At the very bottom, the people who create food, the non-specialized classes, remember, creating a surplus from which the powerful live off the work of others and don't work at all themselves. Marx thinks that everything in society and culture, everything, is shaped by this powerful, idle class at the very top of the social hierarchy that doesn't have to themselves do the hard work that it takes to survive, that lives off the hard work of the masses in the underclass. Everything is shaped by this class to justify their power and to perpetuate their exploitation of their laborers, to keep their position at the top of the hierarchy. And by everything, Marx means everything, politics, religion, culture, everything about society is geared towards normalizing and sustaining this privilege. Marx famously, to take an example, um, wrote that religion is the opiate of the masses. He thought that religion was designed to keep people submissive to people in power by promising them rewards in heaven and stuff like that. But religion wasn't all. There are ideologies like nationalism that he sees as the way the upper class controls the lower class. Um, they form laws to protect their power at the expense of the lower class. If you remember back to Hammurabi's code, this should resonate too. But in the modern day, this includes our values and our instincts to defend the current hierarchy. Let me give you a few examples. It's always hard to think critically about our own assumptions, right? So, for example, a doctor gets high job satisfaction and prestige from their work. They do specialized work. They do a lot of good for a lot of people. 
um, people look up to them in society. A construction worker arguably works harder and with less satisfaction, which you could argue is harder to do. Construction workers don't get paid very much. They don't get looked upon with prestige in society. Society tends not to be very grateful at all for their work. And their work in terms of like actual muscle labor is harder. It causes physical damage. It's probably harder to get up in the morning and go to work if you're a construction worker. Why should we pay the less pleasant, less glamorous job that takes more discipline to make oneself do so much less? Our instinct to value the doctor preserves the hierarchy and serves the interests of the upper class, and people tend not to question it at all. If you start thinking about it, there are lots of examples of ideas that kick around in society that preserve hierarchy the way it is, that keep the people in power in power. For example, you might have thought, why would anybody work if they don't get paid more than somebody else? We can kick that apart too. Why does somebody have to be paid less for you to feel good about yourself and your job? Society can show value differently than paying some people more than others. There's also this idea that if people got paid the same amount of money, for example, some people wouldn't contribute. And yet society tends to set its own norms. If working for a social benefit is the norm, like society is grateful for your work, the theory goes maybe people would adapt and contribute to society without having to be like lured by a higher salary to do it. In other words, we don't have to use different dollar amounts to define what we value. That's something that we choose to do, and that's something that can change. It takes a lot of intentional work to question our assumptions, but that's kind of step one in Marxist analysis of history and society. Think about what you assume about society and really think about it critically in terms of whose interests it serves. If you start looking, you'll see this in the news all the time. Like, if we raise the minimum wage or if we raise taxes on the rich, we will lose jobs or no one would be able to afford anything. This kind of thinking assumes that the rich being less rich isn't even an option or that owners or CEOs could earn less money. That's not an option in society, even though it totally is. And it ignores the borne out fact that giving people at the bottom of the hierarchy more spending money actually fuels the economy too and creates jobs and creates wealth. But people tend to assume the opposite. People tend to assume that much of what you could do to benefit the lower class is just impossible, even though actually it really isn't. Because they benefit from this arrangement, the upper class of people resist change through power, through laws, but also through culture and through ideas. The laborers, the workers, suffer from this arrangement. And if they became fully aware of the fact that it could be changed, if they could see through the ideas and ideology that keeps them in their place, they would have a strong interest in changing things, perhaps through revolution, to make it so that the workers could benefit directly from their work. This basic dynamic, says Marx, is true of all of history and in all societies worldwide. Working people worldwide, regardless of national boundaries, all share a common interest in changing the status quo and changing the way things are. When workers become aware of this, Marx calls it developing a class consciousness, an awareness of themselves as a class with interests that align. Capitalists worldwide tried to hide this by promoting nationalism, religion, racism, and other ideologies that divide the working class. And here again, if you just take five minutes and turn on the news, you will see an idea like this. For example, the idea that immigrants come in and take lower class people's jobs, and that's why there aren't enough jobs for anybody. The idea that minorities are in conflict with one another at the very bottom of the social hierarchy instead of seeing that they have the same interests because they're being exploited by the same people at the very top.
This leads us to Marx's view of history and change. Marx sees history as a series of improvements in how things are produced. This is good. So like first there was the Neolithic Revolution and we learned how to farm and that made life easier. And now comes the Industrial Revolution when we can use machines to make things more easily. Industrialization makes it possible to produce a lot with way less work. And this is good too. Marx has no problem with industrialization and actually he thinks that it's a great thing. The problem for Marx is capitalism, the economic system. Capitalism allocates the benefits of industrialization super duper inefficiently. For example, workers labor for little money to produce things that only the rich can afford while themselves going without or experiencing starvation. If workers are more productive, their wages stay the same and the benefits go to people who are already rich. Now, this is not an efficient way of running an economy, says Marx. And this situation is caused by competition. Businesses don't work together to provide what society needs and instead respond to the market in competition with one another to produce what a small number of rich people want. And here I'll give the example that I give in live class, even though I'm recording it, so I feel a little weird, but think about the stuff that we as a society produce. Truck nuts, for example, are fake testicles designed to be attached to the back of a car. They serve no purpose. I personally think it's one of the stupidest things that I've ever seen in my life. And yet we as a society produce a wide variety of these. We take resources and this is what we make of them for people who can afford a $17 fake testicles to put on the back of their truck. It's absurd. It's extra absurd when you think that there are people who are starving, who are actually working full-time jobs and still don't have enough money to live on. Um, when we think about there are people who would like a job and just there isn't one available for them. And so they are going without. How do we have homeless people and truck nuts in the same society and call ourselves a moral people? For Marx, it wouldn't make sense. Imagine instead how efficient we could be if we leveraged the power of industrial production to work together to satisfy the needs of all society instead of having businesses compete with one another to produce things that maybe we as society don't actually need, like truck nuts. Capitalists who benefit from the system will never want to change it. But as industrial society, which can provide for many, chews up the working class and makes the rich even richer, it becomes necessary to transition to socialism, to get the state involved to different degrees in the economy, to redistribute wealth, to make things a little bit less unequal, and maybe to run some businesses in the public interest. Socialism, though, still allows the fundamental exploitation of the laboring class, though. Remember for Marx, the workers add value to products, but they pay, they get paid a fixed set wage no matter how much they produce, no matter how much value they add. And fundamentally, this is still exploitative. To make a truly efficient and fair economy, according to Marx, the working class would eventually have to find power in numbers, rise up, and have an actual violent armed revolution to take the means of production from the capitalists who would never give them up willingly and institute a new form of society. So in other words, to seize for themselves the things that you need to produce what the economy needs, to institute a totally new form of society, which was called communism. So that was a lot. Pause here to think about what we've covered so far. Think about Marx's view of history and how the world works. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Does this match your experience of life? Do you think that economics really does drive history? Do you think it's something else like ideas, actions of powerful people, etc.? And if you're in a live class now, drop an observation, thought, question, or connection in the chat and then press play again so we can keep going. 
remember, Marx views revolution as necessary to fix the problem that he has identified in human history, right? And remember, we can take one without the other necessarily. Marx believes that the people with property and power make the laws, and they make laws that protect their property and their power. Laws do not serve the interests of the working man or woman, and working men or women must then rise up and stage a revolution to create a new government that serves their and everyone else's interests equally. Working men or women worldwide have common interests due to their common class. And this class identity means that working people everywhere worldwide have an interest in staging a revolution. The government then representing the workers would run the economy, this would be called a command economy, and profits from their work would be distributed equally. And here is the major difference between communism and socialism, and it's a huge difference that people tend not to pay attention to when they talk about these ideas casually. Socialism can work with democracy and it reduces inequality gradually because it only involves some government interference in the economy. Communism aims to revolutionize society and requires an actual violent revolution to eliminate inequality entirely, to form a fundamentally new kind of society. Again, because definitions are really important here, um, take a moment and refresh your memory on command economies and communism. A command economy is an economy in which the government centrally plans all economic activity. Communism is an ideology that works with a command economy. So it's a command economy designed to eliminate inequality. And the goal for communist countries is to create a society where all resources are owned by society as a whole rather than by individuals with the values of equality, but also equal dignity. All work has dignity. In a communist society, society's needs are met by the state providing for people's needs, dictating what is produced and how resources are allocated. So society meets its needs collectively. Government plans what to produce and how to produce it. And what is produced is for everyone to share in the fruits of their labor and the resources of the land equally. Importantly, communism has historically appealed to societies with extremely high levels of wealth inequality or whose natural resources have been exploited by other states. And this is gonna become important when we look at how theory and practice are a little bit different. Note that industrialization is a, a crucially important part of the process of transitioning to communism for Marx. Industrialization meaning just mechanized work. Machines can produce the goods that we need as a society. It was critically important because only through industrialization can you produce enough wealth to support society as a whole comfortably. Importantly, the states that transitioned into communism for real about 100 years down the line skipped the industrialized first part. So our real world examples of communism coming from the Soviet Union, uh, North Korea, Cuba, they didn't actually have the means yet at the time that they transitioned to communism to produce enough to support entire societies. And this is kind of one of the tricks about learning about communism and Karl Marx's theories in the real sort of deep way. Students tend to dismiss communism before learning about it because they argue it doesn't work. See, look, we've got North Korea, we've got the Soviet Union. And yet, communist ideas have held real significant and deep appeal for millions of people in the 19th and 20th centuries. And if you want to understand how history worked, you have to really engage with this idea on its own merits, not through the examples like North Korea and the Soviet Union that, you know, maybe weren't 
wealthy enough to begin with to make this transition as Marx had prescribed it. Remember also that when we talk about Marxism and communism, we're talking about a theory of history, Marxism, and then his prescribed solution to the problems he identifies in history, communism, this economic ideology. So that distinction is pretty important to keep in mind. And finally, we come to our notes for the day, at least part one of our notes. So make sure to get this down in your notebooks, please. Communism is a radical or extreme form of socialism best defined by Karl Marx in the Communist Manifesto. Communists believe that as long as capitalists control the means of production, there can never be true equality. And the only way to create a truly equal society is to overthrow the capitalist class and give the workers equal control of the means of production, stuff you need to make stuff. In this ideal new society, there would be no private property as everything would be shared amongst the commune. The Communist Manifesto argues that industrialization enslaved the worker, and it's a call to action for workers in the world, in the whole world, to unite and seize the means of production through violent revolution to create a new, better world. Importantly for understanding communism's role in moving history moving forward, it's a universalizing ideology. That means that communism speaks to the working class as an international class. Just as the French Revolution declared that all men, regardless of what nation they happen to be in, have certain basic rights and should fight for them, communists argued that every worker, no matter what nation they happen to be in, should overthrow the capitalists in their state and create a new and better world. In this vision of the world, different social classes have more in common with each other internationally than they are separated by national specificities. And so key to understanding how this has worked in history is the conflict between nationalists and communists. Nationalism says you should get your sense of identity and a feeling of superiority based on the state you're from. Like America is the best place to be in kind of thing. Communism says no, identity should come from your class. If you're somebody in the working class, you have more in common with a working class person halfway across the world than you have with a rich person in your own state. It threatens people in power and it threatens the rich big time. And so nationalists tend to hate communists. Communism is a more extreme form of socialism in terms of the solution to economic equalities proposed. Socialism can reduce inequality while coexisting with democratic change. Communism, communism says, nope, we need a revolution. If at this point in the lesson you need a refresher on how different economic ideologies are defined to kind of compare and contrast them, it would be worth pausing here and getting this in your notes as well. For an even more detailed view of how each economic ideology is defined, especially as relates to the Industrial Revolution, perhaps this chart would be helpful too. This is the last slide. So you guys can pause here. If you need this in your notes, get them in your notes and we are done with our lesson.